Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Tom Dream, director of the Wyoming State Geological Survey, discusses the mission of the WSGS and how recent budget impacts has changed the way his department works. Plus, we'll view the department's new interactive oil and gas map and celebrate the 50th anniversary of Jade being named Wyoming's official gemstone. Next on Wyoming Chronicle. And we're pleased now to be joined on the Wyoming Chronicle set um, with the director of the Wyoming State Geological Survey, Tom Dream. Um, director Dream, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. An overview of what the um, survey is to Wyoming is where I think I would like to start. I think that people that are involved in, in industry who communicate with you frequently understand what you do, but there are many viewers who are watching tonight that may not be aware of, of what is the Wyoming State Geological Survey. So let's start mm -hmm. there. Okay. We have a broad mission, and our mission is to characterize, understand, and, and report on the natural resources of the state. And of course, by that I mean oil and gas and coal and trona and, and the rest of the resources as well as groundwater resources. Uh, we also have the mission of reporting on geologic hazards, earthquakes, landslides, volcanic activity, that type of thing. And then lastly, we serve a broader community on people that are interested in geologic phenomena in general. So people who may be traveling to the state, people may, who may be out on a hike and they have a geologic question, and we try to serve that community as well. Wyoming has to be one of the most geologically diverse states in the country, and in fact, not every state has a geological survey, is that correct? That's correct. <clears throat> and, and I actually refer to Wyoming as a geologic wonderland. I, I'm sure, and just by seeing what you have here in your office, and, and your office is here at the University of Wyoming, but you're not affiliated directly with the university. Is that correct? That's that correct. Correct as well. How did you end up in Wyoming? Uh, personally? Yeah. Uh, worked in the industry, uh, oil and gas industry, uh, and was assigned to Casper, Wyoming for a while. Uh, also, there's some ties here. We have a, a property in the western part of the state that we visited. Mm -hmm. Uh, frequently and still do. So uh, my first visit to the state many, many years ago uh, got me enthralled and interested in the state and I've always been interested in coming back to Wyoming not only to work but to live, which I have the privilege of, of doing. You worked overseas for a while. I did. Where did you work? Oh, I worked uh, many countries. You I told worked, me off camera uh, you guys have moved 18 times. Yeah, yeah. So I've worked uh, South America, Venezuela, I've worked uh, West Africa, uh, Angola, Congo, Nigeria, I've worked North Africa, I've worked the Middle East, uh, including Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, the Emirates, uh, Iraq, etc. So uh, yeah, I've had the privilege of working all over the world. All primarily in oil and gas? Yes. And so then you retired? but you ended up here. How did that little segment evolve? Uh, I saw that there was a posted vacancy in the geological survey. Uh, on a whim, <laughs> I applied um, and fortunately was selected. And you're appointed by the executive branch and your term is a six-year term? That's correct. What, um, um, this is a state agency and I'm, I'm curious, Director, um, as all state entities have experienced in the last couple of years significant constraints on their budget. What, how has that affected the State Geological Survey? Um, um, what are some things that you would like to be doing that you can't do or you can't do as well or as quickly? Um, take us into to how that's um, um, impacted what it is that your group does. Uh, it's made us certainly be selective on the work we do and really focused on what's the most important. Uh, the one area that's probably affected us the most is in the hazards side of things. Uh, I wish we could be more proactive in that area on predicting uh, earthquakes and landslides, et cetera. But, uh, you know, I fully understand the position the state is in, but what that has put us in is a more reactive mode than a proactive mode. The, um 
future of the geological survey. Um, um, more science, more technology. As someone who's uh, very lame in, in terms of geology, it's just, goodness, your group has been around since the late 1800s in some respects, and Wyoming has been here longer than that, and we should know about all these things already, but of course, science leads to more questions, which leads to more research. Right. Yeah. yeah. How does that work? Well, uh, we are an inexact science, uh, and because of that, we're always learning, and we're always predicting, and we're always evaluating. There is always data and information. Every well that's drilled in the state of Wyoming, every time someone goes out and takes a sample, every time someone maps an area, we learn something new. And what tends to happen is when you learn something new in one area, it brings up questions in another area. So therefore, it leads to more evaluation. And also, people's needs, people's interests, as you mentioned, have changed. So we don't know what minerals are going to be the most valuable in the future. Uh, it may be something that's very related to a new technology. For example, now things like rare earth elements are very important in uh, renewables injury, I industry. Things like new battery development, energy storage, wind power. There's a lot of new elements that go into those. And of course, one of the things that we have is looking and characterizing and understanding not only where today's mineral needs will be, but perhaps tomorrow's mineral needs will be. You've made the remark that Wyoming is not resource limited. And really, Wyoming's really unique in that regard. Expand on that just a little bit. Well, we have hundreds of years of supply of some, some materials, such as coal, trona, etc. Uh, it is pretty rare for a state to have the diversity of the geology that we have, where you have the number one res reserves in coal and the number one reserves in uranium and significant oil and gas resources. Um, we, I will just, I hate to say scratch the surface, but I would say we are far from mature in all of those industries. Therefore, uh, one of the benefits of the state of Wyoming is, yes, we're sensitive to downturns in the industry that for us are usually caused by price or demand, but the resources are here for when those recover. And I think it should be pointed out that really your office stays out of the political decisions relative to um, mineral development. And talk about that just a little bit. Well, our job is to report on what the resources are, how much they are, where they are, et cetera. Uh, our job is to provide that information so that people who are making political decisions can make informed decisions. And that's what's important to us, is making sure that people make the best informed decision they can. You've also talked about how geotourism is an emerging um, industry that's becoming beneficial to the state. What is geotourism? Geotourism is everything from universities that set up geological field camps here to train geologists from other states that work around the world, to the young child who's traveling with their parents through the state and have curiosity on dinosaurs or rocks or how something formed or why something formed. That's now becoming an, an industry. Yeah, people travel to Wyoming uh, to understand the geology and see geologic phenomenon. Or they'll even travel from other countries to look at well-exposed geology here in Wyoming to see how it relates to geology that may be buried in their particular country. Uh, it is probably uh, hidden, but the analogy I would use is the upcoming solar eclipse, mm -hmm. and you can see how people are so interested in the solar eclipse. Well, there's people that are interested in geology that travel to Wyoming for the very same purpose. Interesting. Um, what's on the near horizon for the Wyoming State Geological Survey? What projects are you most excited about that are, that are coming on your radar? I'm excited about several things. One is how we get our message across to people. And one of the things I want us to do is evolve with the modern technologies on getting our information and data out to people. And that's by electronic means. So I'm always looking to improve our website and our communications. And I'm trying to look at what the next, tech, next technologies may be to get, get that out. So before we used to do all of our maps, say, in paper form, how do we do our maps so that we get, get them out in a format that people can access on their phones, as, as you have mentioned before, or in real time. So that's high in the horizon. Also, I want to make sure that we are collecting 
uh, and keeping many things in mind. In other words, if we're collecting oil and gas information and it's in a particular area where we also want to, to uh, collect groundwater information, I want to collect both bits of information at the same time. And again, it comes back to, to what more you efficient. said before. Not only become more efficient, to per, but to also show uh, a more holistic view of things so that people can not only understand the resource that may be extracted, but the impact of that resource that's being extracted on other things like surface and groundwater and et cetera. And that comes down to our mission of of not only understanding, but, but responsibly developing those resources in the state. And you also have communicated that if people are really interested about learning about Wyoming geology, that there are resources in their local community colleges at the University of Wyoming and on your website, and you encourage those. Right, and I would also encourage people to contact our geologists if they have a question. Uh, we love to answer questions from the public and on their curiosities. I think one of the things geologists love to do more than anything else is share their knowledge and information and see the excitement of people when they learn about the, the, the geologic phenomenon in, in, in this wonderful state. Director Dreen, um, thanks for joining us. We have more to learn now about the uh, work of, of some of your staff here, and, and we appreciate your time this morning. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Hi, I'm Rachel Toner. I'm one of the oil and gas geologists here at the Wyoming State Geological Survey. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about the oil and gas map of Wyoming. Um, the oil and gas map of Wyoming is one of the survey's more popular products that we publish. And about a year and a half ago, we decided to take on the task of updating the map since the last version um, was updated back in 2012. Um, when Rainey, Linz, and I, who is the other oil and gas geologist here at the survey, started looking into these previous versions of the map, we started realizing what a time-consuming and labor-intensive effort it was to update the maps. And the reason being is that one of the main features of the map are oil and gas fields. And an oil and gas field is typically or generally defined as a group of wells that are within the same spatial vicinity of each other, but that also produce out of the same reservoir or set of reservoirs. And in order to update the fields in the past, the map authors had had to individually hand draw, scan, digitize, and attribute these fields. And while hand-drawn fields are very visually appealing, it also introduces the uh, possibility of human error. And because oil and gas wells are constantly being drilled in the state, um, these fields then can change very quickly and then become very outdated. We did go ahead and publish a web version of the oil and gas map of Wyoming using ESRI's ArcGIS online platform. And it's available for free and can be accessed at the survey's website, either through the front page, which is here, <coughs> or through our oil and gas maps and publications page. So right off the bat, you'll, you'll see a um, kind of a brief description of what the map is and some tips for using the map. And if you don't ever want to see that again, you can click that button or just get rid of it by hitting OK. So this is how the map looks when you first open it up. Over here on the very far top right, um, if you click the I, it will, it will expand out a window that shows some of, it's almost like an abbreviated legend. So it'll show some of the reservoir abbreviations and our um, field designations. So that was where, if you're looking for what things mean, that's where you would go. Um, the next uh, icon over, if you click on it, it will expand out <coughs> a window that will show all the layers that are um, available on the web map. A lot of the layers on the web map are the same as the paper version. However, um, one benefit to using a web map is you're able to show layers that 
on a paper map, it would overwhelm the whole, <laughs> the whole map. For example, um, oil and gas wells um, in the state are not included on the paper map. And that's because as of the end of 2016, there were over 121,000 wells permitted in the state. And if you were to show that on a paper map, it would be one huge blob. <laughs> and especially in the Powder River and the Green River basins. One of the other data layers that we were able to include on the web map that we were not able to uh, put on a paper version is the Wyoming 500,000 scale geology layer. And this provides a, a statewide regional look at the geology of Wyoming. So for example, you can zoom into the Bighorns and see what rock types are located there. One of the really good advantages to a web map is also the ability to click on any feature within the map and see uh, its attributes in more detail. So for example, if I click on a well, I, there will be a window that pops up and then you can look at the specifics of what is involved with that well, when it was drilled, what its name is, who owns it, information like that. And this clicking and identifying can be applied to, um, to fields. We can look at a field and get its information. Basically, any layer that you have turned on in the web map, you can click on and see its attributes. Okay, so one of the other things that you can do with the attributes is to actually open up a grid or an app attribute table down here at the bottom of the map. And so this table down here will list all the attributes in, in a format that you can then export, you can export it out to a CSV file or that's easily imported into Excel. Um, and then this table also provides you the option to filter what records you want to look at. So for example, if I wanted to look at gas plants that uh, process helium, I can add a filter to this and say I want everything that processes helium, and it will give me two, two examples of gas plants in the state. So we've got Labarge and we've got Riley Ridge. So I can select one of those and zoom in to that gas plant. And the base layer that I've got on here is just a topographic base layer. But if you want to look at more detail, you can change it to an imagery base layer. And when you zoom out a little bit, there's the gas plant and how it looks from an aerial photography. On the web map, we were able to add in some tools that provide some added functionality for the user that is, would also be unavailable on a paper version. So up here on the left-hand side, we can search for fields or wells. So if you have an API number of a well that you're specifically interested in, you can type its uh, API number in and it will zoom into it for you and pop up its attributes for you. Um, if you're looking for a, a field by a specific basin or which fields are in a basin, you can choose the Bighorn Basin and execute that and it should highlight all the fields within the Bighorn Basin. So just running down the list of queries if you're interested in fields by reservoirs. I'm going to try and find all the, the fields that are producing out of the Sussex, shan or the Sussex Sandstone and all the fields highlighted in red here are indicative of fields that are producing. So most of them are in the Powder River Basin. There's a few in the Wind River Basin. Uh, as I mentioned, horizontal wells are starting to become the norm in the state. So if you want to find all the horizontal wells that are being, uh, that have been 
drilled within the Denver Basin around Cheyenne. You can make a, a shape that limits your query and it looks like there's been 121 horizontal wells there. You also have the ability within this map to create some really simple production charts, um, either oil and gas, oil or gas production by basin for the last 35 years. Um, so if you want to look at the state as a whole, you can pop up a, a pretty simple chart that will run through each basin and then have the production data by, um, by barrels over on the other side. If you want to limit that to a specific basin only, again, you can use these area restrictions and apply that and you can look at only the Powder River Basin throughout time. So here's what the production is from 2015 back through 1980. Yeah, my name's Wayne Sutherland. Uh, I work here at the Wyoming State Geological Survey and uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the designation of Nephrite Jade as the Wyoming State Gemstone. Uh, Wyoming Jade was first uh, discovered in the early 1900s. Uh, we're not sure exactly when, but the popularity of it began in 1936. But uh, at the time, there wasn't a real world market for it from Wyoming. Uh, people were not aware of it. Local people went out to find Jade, and they were excited when they found it. And the word did get out. Some of the people in China that were really interested in Jade, as they always have been, came into Wyoming and started purchasing some of the jade from uh, local people. And as long as they were uh, making a little profit on it or making a living, they were quite happy. Over time, people realized that the Wyoming jade that they were finding was some of the highest quality jade in the world. Uh, there's, a, there's a reason for it. You know, jade is a, uh, it's a mineral, that, or it's a rock that's made up by a, a series of uh, minerals uh, actinolite and tremolite, but what they are is they have long fibers and they're kind of interlocked in a felted manner, kind of like the felt of a hat. And that interlocking gives it a really extreme toughness, making it one of the toughest gemstones in the world. It's very hard to break. The other thing that makes it uh, you know, a great gemstone is the fact that it has great clarity, great color, and the material that was found on the surface back, beginning back in the 30s and then into the 40s, and Jade Rush actually went uh, up through the 1970s. But the high quality of the material combined with this toughest gave it that reputation worldwide. With that reputation in the late 60s, it was designated the Wyoming State Gemstone. Where people found jade in Wyoming was uh, central Wyoming in the Granite Mountains area between Riverton and Casper, east of Lander, over by Jeffrey City. Jeffrey City was kind of the center of uh, the finding of jade, but it extends in a much broader region than that. However, the easy pickings and the early pickings was in that area. To understand why, the Granite Mountains were a mountain range that was uplifted about 45 million years ago. And when it uplifted, it had veins of jade in it. Those jade veins were eroded with the mountains as they uplifted, so the jade tumbled off to the sides of the mountains. Then about 20 million years ago, the Granite Mountains collapsed, so the jade tumbled back. And the residual material is big piles of cobbles and boulders and gravels off to the sides of the granite mountains. The jade being a lot tougher than the other rocks that were eroded, it was more resistant to erosion, both chemical and mechanical. Because of that, you had an artificial concentration near the surface where the streams were flowing and the jade was moving around. That artificial concentration gave us the impression that jade was everywhere and people were finding anywhere from beautiful small pieces to multi-ton boulders. That lasted uh, for quite a while, but over time, more and more people looking for jade, a lot of the easy pickings 
were taken. So you can still go find jade in that country, but it's a lot harder. If you go after a rainstorm or after the spring runoff, you're more likely to find some, particularly on the sides of the streams or on the edges of uh, hills. But uh, once again, there's, there's not as much now as there was on the surface. However, that surface of gravel and cobbles and boulders, that whole thing is thousands of feet thick. So over time, boulders will erode out and appear on the surface. If you're the lucky person that happens by after it was exposed and you recognize that it is jade, you're in luck. The key is you have to recognize what jade looks like. This is a piece of jade that uh, was found out on the surface there. A lot of it has a little weathering rind, this uh, red to cream color. Sometimes it's a white color. Of course, the really lucky people are the ones that find it without the weathering rind with a natural polish on it. This is a wind polish on the piece of jade. And central Wyoming, because of the high winds out there, a lot of sand moves, and over the thousands of years, you get a really nice polish like this. This is called a jade slick, and this is what everyone wants to find. But a lot of the stuff uh, will have a surface like this. And when you look at that, you say, well, that can't be jade. But if you break it open and look at the edges, you can tell that it is. So that's one of the, one of the problems with hunting jade, is you have to know what to look for. Uh, I know a lot of people that have gone out there, and I've gone out with people and walked along the ground and somebody says, oh, look at that piece of jade there. I didn't see it, they did. Part of it's calibrating your eye to know exactly what to look for. And there are some people who are very, very good at spotting a piece of jade even when there's only a little tiny piece exposed. It could be a larger rock. Okay, in recognition of the 50th anniversary of jade being designated the Wyoming State Gemstone, we're working on an investigation of jade in the state, which includes uh, not only where it occurs, but how it occurs, the chemistry of the jade, and uh, you know, some of the other characteristics of it that I've already mentioned. And when we get this publication out, we're not sure quite when it'll come out, but uh, it will be on our website. We will have some press releases so people can uh, look at it, probably download it, and uh, learn a lot more about Wyoming Jade.